What's up, everyone? Welcome to this day in Philly sports history for February 8th, 2023. We are one day closer to the Super Bowl. It is midweek, and at this point, the Eagles are back in the like, and Chiefs both are in full fledged pra- practices. So we're, we're, it's like a normal football week, and it's Wednesday, and the anticipation is just, it's building, it's building, it's building. It's going to be a long couple days, but we will get through it. Before we get into anything, let's take a look at today's Philly Sports Black History Spotlight. Today, we're going to look at Charles Bloxon. He was originally from Norristown, Pennsylvania, and his story is, is unique because, and I couldn't find the exact, I saw both, so I'm just going to say an elementary teacher of his said that Something along the lines of black people never contributed to American history or black people have no history and they are born to serve whites. So this would have been like late 30s, early 40s when uh, this teacher said this to him um, and it, it really struck him as, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. So he went home, asked his parents and his dad said, I assure you that's not true and, and kind of went through on some of the things that, that he knew um, so it's something that always stuck with him uh, throughout his school career as well as when he went to college uh, at Penn State. And he was always like on road trips and things like that. He was always going into bookstores trying to learn as much as he could about black and African culture um, and just soak it all in, look for artifacts, talk to people and things like that. Um, so he, in high school, he was a star athlete for, for Nordstown football team. Uh, as well as their track and field. He did go on to play football at Penn State, where he shared a backfield and was the blocking back for uh, NFL Hall of Famer Lenny Moore. And at the end of his college career, uh, Blackson had a chance. He was made an offer. I don't know how it worked with the draft, and I, he may have been like an undrafted free agent, but he was offered a, a chance to play professionally for the New York Giants, and he turned it down. And he felt um, like he could have made a decent living playing for the Giants, uh, but he felt like he had a higher calling and would go on to dedicate his life to searching for any books, letters, photos, any primary source documents that kind of told the story of black and African history and culture because of that, those comments that his uh, elementary teacher at Norristown, I know, I'm not sure which elementary school it was, but... He was very successful in his, he's still alive, and he was just very successful in doing this. He created many museum exhibits and school programs and just getting the the message out there and educating the masses on not only black in America or black American history, but as well as just African history and culture and just really has dedicated his life to ensure that the stories don't get forgotten. They get told. They, the culture gets celebrated and things like that. Um, my connection to him is there is a boxing collection at Temple University at in Sullivan Hall. And what it is, it's basically the most prestigious collection of black and African artifacts, um, history, those primary source documents that, that tell the story. And I had a class um, of junior or senior year that was racism in college athletics that required us to kind of go in and research some of the more – because everybody knows the Jackie Robinson story. Everybody knows Rosa Parks. Everybody knows Martin Luther King. And I'm not diminishing what they're doing it did at all. But a lot of these other guys, and that's what I've been trying to do this month with some of these stories, is highlight some of these people that – had a just as big of impact on black history, black culture, and, and basically getting the message and changing the narrative and, and fighting for civil rights and everything like that that maybe you don't know about. And it was very interesting to just go in and just see this vast collection of just artifacts of things that I, as a white male, never even knew about. So it was actually really cool. So today we celebrate Charles Bloxon for his work in getting the message and educating the masses and fighting for civil rights and and making sure that black history is a part of our history um, and celebrating the African culture. So thank you, Mr. Bloxon, for that. All right, big game for the Sixers tonight up in Boston. 
Uh, good measuring stick game. Hopefully, uh, both teams will be at full strength so we can kind of see where, where the Sixers are. Uh, there are only a couple games behind them for the top seed in the East, so we'll be very excited to see that game. Uh, the Owls take on Southern Methodist. And while SMU is kind of off, having an off year, it's always a tough place to play down there. Hopefully they can come bounce back after that that rough show. Second, I shouldn't even say rough showing. The first half was good. The rough second half against Houston the other night. All right, back to our Super Bowl coverage. And, and honestly, there's not really any major updates. Um, Injury-wise, it seems like both teams are going to be – all relatively healthy at full strength. Uh, Nicole Hardman, I think, is the only one that is definitely already been ruled out. I know Juju is a little banged up, um, so we'll see. I mean, I, Kadarius Tony's banged up. Like, not really sure where they're all going to fall, but it looks like everybody is um, – going to be relatively healthy for it. And the, I guess the other big story I saw on the local news was just that lots of people are getting surprise trips to the Super Bowl. Uh, they're going, coming into their work or their families or whatever are celebrating. So, um, <coughs> be, <coughs> excuse me, um, don't forget about me if you have one of those surprise trips. <coughs> Cough. But uh, anyway, so the, the other big story, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to just – Juju Smith-Schuster, speaking of him, made a comment that the best Philly cheesesteaks don't come from Philly. Now, a lot of people got pissed off about this. And Philly, we got to be better, man. We have our team in the Super Bowl for the second straight year. We had our team in the World Series. We have a top three team in the NBA Eastern Conference right now. Like, is this what we're going to fight about? Like, stop. And, and truthfully, I don't know if he's wrong or not. I grew up in the suburbs, and I got some pretty damn good cheesesteaks in Chester County. So we'll, we'll just kind of leave it at that. It's up to personal preference. One thing I think we can all agree on, Pats and Geno's are garbage um, unless it's 2 a.m. and you're hammered and you're just looking for, for a snack. Um, the other thing that this might be the most controversial thing I've ever said on this podcast, Cheese Whiz on a cheesesteak is disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. But enough about that. Oh, and – the, the other thing is, and this is another thing a lot of people don't agree on with cheesesteaks, is I like mine finely chopped. I don't want big chunks like how Pat's and Geno's do. No, no, it needs to be very finely chopped. And So hit me up in the comments and let me know how you like your cheesesteaks. But this is the, this is the big story. Juju saying you can't the best cheesesteaks aren't from Philly. And I don't know. He might be right. There's some good ones in the suburbs. But, I mean... Anywhere, like I lived in Roxborough for how many years, and there was not one place within five minutes of my house that I would regularly go to that did not have a good cheesesteak. Anyway, this day in Philly sports history, we're going to go back to 1936. And on this day, it was the first ever NFL draft. It took place at the Ritz Carlton in downtown Philly, and it was implemented to end the bidding wars that kind of led to to who got what college player so basically it came down to it was a free-for-all and it was burt bell was the eagles owner and came up with the idea for basically let's have a draft let's do it in reverse order of standing so the last place gets first pick and then you go back from that way first pick that year happened to belong to the eagles who went two and nine in 1935 the first pick that year was Jay Bernwanger, who was a halfback out of Chicago, which Chicago at the time was in the Big Ten. They were one of the founding members. Just a little bit of trivia there for you guys. Uh, he basically made it clear, I'm never going to play for the Eagles, never played in Philly. So they ended up trading him to the, his rights to the Bears. He ended up never playing for the Bears and ended up being a rubber salesman, um, like rubber for tires. So get your mind out of the gutters there. Um, but the first NFL draft was nine rounds, so there's 81 picks. Uh, that draft itself ended up with four Hall of Famers, and they, they've expanded it multiple times over the years. Um, and now it's a big three-day-long event where the host city um, – it, it travels, so it's it, it's a spectacle like most things with the NFL. But on this day, 1936, the first ever NFL draft was held at the Ritz-Carlton in Philly. Let's go Sixers. Let's go Owls. We're so close to the Super Bowl. Shout out and mad props to Charles Bloxon for all of his work. Go have yourselves a Wednesday. It's all downhill from here, baby. And until next time, I'll see you when I see you.